Finally, a paleo profile. What do we got? Carnotaurus? You mean that weird thing that is basically a mouth with legs? Yes, today we have the extremely bizarre Carnotaurus of Argentina, and with a name that literally translates to meat-eating bull, no lie, that's what its name means, how could I not do a paleo profile on this strangely awesome animal, which I have dubbed the Horn Cretaceous Cheetah? Discovered in 1984, just as George Orwell predicted, Carnotaurus is known from only one single well-preserved skeleton, and yet it is strangely one of the best understood theropods of the southern hemisphere of Mesozoic Earth. Carnotaurus descends from a group of dinosaurs called the Albarosaurids, a group of four-fingered theropods that are relatively unrelated to most other theropod groups, splitting off from the ancestor to all theropods pretty early on, the group's closest relatives being Ceratosaurus and even more primitive relative being Dilophosaurus. The group's evolution is a strange one and seems to have happened independently for most other dinosaurs. Some other defining characteristics of the group being small arms, short skulls, and crests. Living during the late Cretaceous, just a few million years before the famous T-Rex in North America, Carnotaurus lived in Argentina. At the time, South America had, relatively speaking, recently split from what we now call Africa after millions of years being connected. South America became completely separated from the rest of the world, isolating the inhabitants from the other continents, and resulting in many unique and independent evolutionary adaptations, kind of like modern-day Australia. One of those animals to diverge and evolve is a medium-sized theropod, Carnotaurus. Based off of only one very well-preserved fossil specimen, Carnotaurus was about 10 feet tall and between 25 to 30 feet long, hardly the towering giant seen in Disney's dinosaur, but still very large and threatening enough for me to go, nope. And no, the specimen is not a juvenile. The skeleton belonged to an adult individual, as indicated by the few sutures in the brain case. So, this was about as large as they got. And although Carnotaurus was large, its soft tissue preservations and skeleton show it was a very leanly built predator, and would have been rather skinny looking. It was lean and thin. It would definitely not look as bulky as some other theropods like T-Rex. Think less lion and more cheetah, as the body shape goes. The overall body of Carnotaurus is very weird, as it has a very flat, almost bulldog-like skull, extremely long legs, a rigid and muscular tail, and teeny tiny vestigial babby arms. Overall, the entire animal was basically a mouth with two very long, once again, luscious legs and a tail, with really no forelimbs or arms. Now, where do you start with all those crazy traits and adaptations? Well, first we should start out with what role did Carnotaurus play in the ecosystem? And to understand that, we need to look at all around Carno's body. The skull of Carnotaurus was proportionally shorter and deeper, meaning taller, than any other theropod carnivorous dinosaur, and is rather small compared to the rest of the body, which brings up the question, why did Carnotaurus have such a short skull? Well, it has to do with Carnotaurus's niche. Carnotaurus's jaws and snout were very short and definitely not as elongated as other theropods. These jaws do not have as many muscle attachments as most theropods, which means the jaws only delivered a very weak bite force, especially compared to something like T-Rex. Nonetheless, this weak bite could deliver a very, very quick and chomping motion. Quick bites are more important than stronger bites when capturing small prey, as shown by studies of modern crocodiles. The skull and especially lower jaw of Carnotaurus had a high degree of cranial kinesis, skull flexibility, meaning when Carnotaurus ate or took a bite out of something, different parts of the skull would move around and shift in order to reduce total stress on the bone. This is a common trait seen in modern snakes and animals that swallow prey items whole. This maybe implies that Carnotaurus swallowed its prey whole or in big chunks. It may have also supported evidence of a throat pouch, a bag-like organ in the neck that holds prey items inside the body, similar to the throat pouches seen in a pelican. The eyes of Carna are also situated in a way that the eyes are angled, facing slightly forward, enabling Carnotaurus to see in binocular vision. This is also a common trait seen in predatory animals that allows depth perception, the ability to judge distances between you and your prey. And not to mention all this combined with Carnotaurus' very, very long legs that take up probably two-thirds of the body, and its very muscular tail, which are both definitely adapted for sprinting and chasing. Long legs are traits common with pursuit predators, such as sub-adult Tyrannosaurus. Carnotaurus' legs are extremely long. In dinosaurs, the most important locomotive muscle was located in the tail. This muscle, called the caudofemoralis, attaches to the fourth trochanter, a prominent ridge on the thigh bone, and pulls the thigh backward 
when contracted. Now, in the tail vertebra of Carnotaurus, the caudal ribs did not protrude horizontally, T-shaped, as in most other dinosaurs such as T-Rex, but were angled against the vertical axis of the vertebra, forming a V-shape. This would provide additional space for the caudal femoralis muscle, larger than any other theropod. And before I bore you with more muscular babble, all you need to know is that the tail of Carnotaurus was extremely muscular and stiff, and the shape of the caudal ribs in the tail allowed for more muscles in the hip and legs, which permitted extremely fast locomotion in addition to its very, very long legs and flexible hips. These adaptations combined enabled Carnotaurus to be one of the fastest, if not the fastest theropod ever, maybe 30, 35 miles per hour, which is about as fast, if not faster than a galloping horse, which is a really big deal for something of that size running that fast. But one more important note concerning the tail though, is that although Carnotaurus was very fast, it was not at all agile. It couldn't make quick or sharp turns. This is because the vertebra and the tail are very stiff, meaning the tail barely bent. This presents a problem because the tail is what steered all theropods. A stiff and straight tail does not allow a dinosaur to make sharp turns. This would be a severe handicap for Carnotaurus and probably resulted in many failed hunts ending with Carnotaurus not being able to turn with its prey and Carnotaurus slipping, falling, or tripping onto the ground. So if you're being chased by a Carnotaurus, remember sharp turns. A study of the skull of Carnotaurus has revealed that it could support downward thrusting motions against a prey creature. This has brought the suggestion that Carnotaurus may have used its head like a club or hatchet when dropping its head down hard and fast while the mouth was open so the teeth could penetrate with the momentum to strike instead of by muscle alone. This is particularly interesting when you consider the neck of Carnotaurus was quite long compared to other theropods, and would have helped to facilitate such hacking action from the skull. And when you factor in that the jaws would have been capable of opening very quickly, this further implies that a fury of fast strikes may have been used to take down prey. All these adaptations combined are traits seen in animals that hunt smaller prey items. By chasing them down and catching them by using the jaws and head, Carnotaurus was an extremely fast pursuit predator that ran down prey items that were smaller than them and then whacked the prey with a swift biting motion from its head, or grabbed them with a quick snap of the jaws once it caught up. Backward facing teeth would grip the prey in the mouth. After this, Carnotaurus would swallow the prey whole, or at least large chunks of it, as the jaw and skull would shift. Crazy, right? The closest modern equivalent to Carnotaurus really is a cheetah. Long legs, short skull, eyes situated on the front of the head, chasing down prey. Carnotaurus was a sprinter and basically a late Cretaceous cheetah, running down prey items as fast as it could. And that's why I like to call Carnotaurus the Cretaceous cheetah. Alright, now that we know what Carnotaurus' role in the ecosystem was, let's move on to its very unique traits and their functions. And well, I guess we should start out with Carnotaurus' most definable trait, and where it gets its name, the horns. The horns are situated on the top of the skull, just above the eyes. These bony horns in life were probably covered in slightly longer keratin horns, similar to the keratin-coated horns of modern-day bovids. The tops of these horns are rather flat. We really need to see more specimens to see if these horns are sexually dimorphic or only appear when the animal is sexually mature before we can conclusively understand their function. The problem these horns propose is that no predatory animal, like ever, had horns like this. And therefore, it makes it hard to make a modern comparison, especially as far as functionality goes. It has been very much debated over the exact function, and to this day we do not know and probably will never know, but there are two main hypotheses concerning what Carnotaurus's horns were used for, with evidence supporting both. And it is easier to say what they were not used for before we say anything about what they were used for. They were definitely not used for high force bashing and ramming between rivals for dominance, like big horned sheep. A considerable amount of studies have shown that the neck vertebra in the actual skull of Carnotaurus could not withstand that great amount of pressure. A high energy bashing and ramming motion would probably spell doom for a Carnotaurus. A full on bashing with the same amount of force as a bighorn would probably kill a Carnotaurus. They also probably weren't used for stabbing or piercing prey items as well. The horns are rather small and positioned on the very top of the head, making it very unlikely that they were used for anything predatory, as it would be especially hard to hit something while chasing down prey, and lowering the head to such an extent would be very difficult. And the fact that no predator in all of discovered history uses horns like that also doesn't support the idea that the horns were used to impale prey, or even hunting. 
Based on their poor functionality, not really being practical compared to the more useful mouth, and the horns being poorly placed on the skull for a predatory purpose, I think we can rule out the possibility of the horns being used to catch prey. Now let me move on to the more likely functions of the horns. Now, theory number one is that the horns were used in combat, but not for bashing or ramming, but for slow pushing and shoving battles between rivals. The top of the horns are flat, and definitely could be used between a Carnotaurus pair to force against each other. The strong neck, muscles of Carnotaurus, and overall flat skull would have allowed this. In 2009, scientists concluded that the bones in the skull of Carnotaurus were fused, meaning they joined into one bone, allowing for a strong skull that distributed pressure throughout the head without fracture points or cracks. This would only be helpful in an environment where an animal must have pressure put on their skulls. Further evidence that they are pushed and shoved using their heads. These battles wouldn't be as violent or aggressive as the clashing battles of bighorns, but would be more like the shoving battles between Komodo dragons. The two would try to force one another back by the use of their headgear. At some points of the battle, the two would interlock their skulls and push head to head, and at other points they would try to push lower down at the bottom near the legs. The winner would most likely push the loser down or into until he or she would give up. The other theory goes that the horns were used for display, like the horn-billed birds of today. This theory states that the horns served only to appeal to the eyes. This is much like a substantial amount of modern animals with strange headgear, such as many species of modern dinosaurs like the cassowary and once again the hornbill, which only use their horn-like crest for display, not combat. And because birds are closer related to Carnotaurus than mammals, it is probably very likely the same headgear liking behavior was seen in Carnotaurus. Females might have chosen a mate not through combat, but through appearance. And because all dinosaurs probably saw in color, these horns might have been covered in a beautiful range of colors to attract a member of the opposite sex. Females might have lined up to see male Carnotauruses from the front to judge them by color and by size, such as modern birds. An image such as this might not have been too uncommon in a Carnotaurus mating ritual. This strange frontward facing angle was created by John Conway and will be brought up again when we talk about Carnotaurus's arms and more mating rituals. And as bizarre as this answer might be, dinosaurs have exhibited weirder behavior. Dinosaurs in general have always had strange behavior especially concerning mating. It is also quite possible both of these theories are correct. Maybe they were both covered in colors and used for display, but were also used in shoving contests. Or maybe we are completely wrong and they were used for some yet to be understood purpose. Non-avian dinosaur behavior is a bit of a mystery to us and probably will remain one. Maybe these horns might have been used to root up soil or strip bark from trees. The male blue wildebeest reams the bark of, and branches of trees to impress the females and lure them into his territory. Maybe Carnotaurus did the same, we just don't know. I personally believe we should look to modern birds as bottles for the uses of these horns. I think it is more likely these horns were used a lot like the, the crests of the modern cassowary and hornbill, and that these horns were used merely for display. From what we know about modern dinosaurs is that dinosaur females prefer flashy colors and dances over physical fighting, making them almost the polar opposite of mammals, which put a lot more focus on muscles and strength. It is probable non-avian dinosaurs functioned the same way and relied more on flashy colors and dances over combat, like their close relatives. I think Carnotaurus treated their horns like how modern birds treat their headgear for mostly display purposes. But who knows, I could be very, very wrong. It is still very plausible Carnotaurus's horns were used for combat and physical shoving matches. Again, Carnotaurus is a very unique horned animal, as there are almost no predatory animals with horns to such an extent, and therefore we do not have anything to model Carnotaurus after, leaving the book wide open. Now let's move on to Carnotaurus's other most definable trait, its teeny weeny cute arms. Yes, like most Albarosaurids, such as Majungasaurus, Carnotaurus had these very, very tiny vestigial forelimbs. And I know T-Rex gets a lot of crap for having tiny arms, but look at this guy. And let me stress that these vestigial arms evolved entirely independently from Tyrannosaurus. I commonly hear people saying because of these tiny arms, Carnotaurus was a relative of T-Rex, and this is very, very wrong. Carnotaurus is not at all related to T-Rex. T-Rex is closer related to birds than Carnotaurus. Carnotaurus arms are some of the smallest proportional to the body of any animal. On these arms were four-fingered hands, which betray the group's independent evolution, as most other theropods lost these fingers and only possessed two or three. So Carnotaurus really couldn't give you a middle finger because it really didn't have a middle finger. 
The arms fit into the socket of the shoulders, making them point backwards with the palms of the hands facing inward, in a resting position. This goes for all of Barra swords. Due to such reduction, the entire arm was held straight, and the elbow joints were immobile. Which means, they couldn't move their elbows. How Carnotaurus and other Alboros swords held their arms is completely unlike that of all other predatory dinosaurs. These limbs are definitely vestigial and probably reduced due to lack of function in catching prey, as the ancestors of Carnotaurus and other Alboros swords became more specialized in using their mouths and heads over using their arms in hunting prey. Over time, mutations must have favored smaller arms over bigger ones to save energy. And over millions of years, the end results were wimpy, relatively useless arms. Now, I know what you're saying. If these arms are so tiny, why did Carnotaurus even have them? What function did these arms have? Well, that my friend is a very, very interesting question. Upon closer examination, Albertosaurid arms are actually unique from most other theropod dinosaurs, not just because they were vestigial, but because how they enter the shoulder. The head of the humerus of the arms of all Albertosaurids was round and ball-like, a feature indicating that a substantial amount of motion was possible in the shoulder joint. Due to this, Carnotaurus could stick their little arms out sideways, unlike any other dinosaur. Now this strange feature has inspired a few strange ideas. One theory is that this sticking out motion helped Carnotaurus when mating, linking a pair by their two arms together for support. Similar to the theories concerning the also vestigial limbs of the whale, Basilosaurus. But that's a little bit boring. We are talking about dinosaurs here. Let me get this straight, this is almost entirely speculative. Another and my personal favorite theory concerning these arms was created surprisingly independently between two groups of scientists. The theory goes that these baby arms were display structures and functioned like flashers. What Darren Niche calls arm waggling. Okay, this brings back my point about Carnotaurus from the front. When facing frontwards, Carnotaurus looks strange, almost alien. The large horns would be facing at you and you would be able to see their amazing colors if they had them. But let's just say, a male Carnotaurus wants to really dazzle females, or wants to scare an enemy away. He would use his little baby arms that are obscured by the frontward facing position and wham, rapidly moves them to face sideways, flashing the female or attacker, flashing the female or attacker with his arms that were once hidden by the body due to the arms facing inward and backward. These arms would, like the horns, be covered in bright colors and might have matched the colors of the horns, making it look like Carnotaurus had two pairs of horns or something. These arms would waggle inwards and outwards, doing a little mating dance for the females. This would be used as a way to tell others, I'm here and I'm ready, like how we flex our muscles. This would also intimidate attackers as they would have a hard time determining where the head of the animal was and get confused. This Carnotaurus flashing arm dance thing might sound very ridiculous, but, but compared to what modern day birds do, this is pretty tame. Another theory is that because the arms had the ability to stick straight out and cling aerodynamically back to the body, maybe they were used to help steer the animal while running, somewhat like the wings of the modern ostrich. As previously discussed, almost everything else about Carnotaurus is superbly adapted to life chasing and sprinting, and the steering arms would only further aid this lifestyle. Like the horns, the exact function of the arms is a mystery, simply adding to the weirdness of this dino. Now, finally, we get to the skin covering of Carnotaurus. Carnotaurus was the first theropod to have extensive skin impressions preserved alongside its fossil. Carnotaurus is probably the only legit, fully scaly theropod. No other theropod fossil preserves scaly skin that covers the body to such an extent as Carnotaurus. These skin impressions show that most, if not all, of Carnotaurus was covered in scales. These scales were not like the scales seen in snakes or lizards, as they did not overlap. These scales were more like a mosaic polygonal in shape, they were placed one next to another in a cohesive skin covering. These scales were only interrupted by large osteoderms, large bony deposits forming scales, plates. Our Carnotaurus specimen preserves scales all throughout the body. The scale preserved places are the lower jaw, the front of the neck, the shoulder girdle, the rib cage, the largest patch of skin corresponding at the anterior front part of the tail. Originally, the right side of the skull also was covered with large skin patches. This was only recognized when the skull was prepared and these skin patches were accidentally destroyed. There were large knob-like bumps running all along the sides of the neck, back, and tail. These bumps are called osteoderms and a scientist suggests that these structures may have protected the animal's sides when fighting members of the same species and other theropods arguing that the same structures can be found on the neck of the modern iguana, where they provide limited protection in combat. If these scales were used for combat, this further proves the hypothesis suggesting Carnotaurus used its horns in shoving battles. 
And although the scales cover most of the body in our specimen, they do not tell the whole story. And even if there is no evidence of feathers in our specimen, that doesn't mean they weren't there. Body parts that commonly have feathers in other dinosaurs did not preserve, such as sections of the arm, tail, and top of the midsection. And to add, feathers need much better conditions to preserve than scales. Scales are more easier to preserve than feathers, as feathers need very, very specific and rare conditions to preserve. It is certainly possible Carnotaurus had feathers, and they just didn't preserve. We actually have found numerous species of dinosaurs that possessed both scales and feathers simultaneously. Calendodromaeus, Juravarator, and Concavenator. All distant relatives to Carnotaurus had both scales and feathers. And because we know for certain that the ancestors of Carnotaurus had feathers, it's not outlandish that Carnotaurus might have had both scales and feathers. Concavenator is probably the closest relative to Carnotaurus with pretty extensive preservations of skin coverings. So maybe it is possible that Carnotaurus might have had feather covering similar to concavenator, with most of the body, if not all of the body, being scaly, such as the tail and legs, and only the ends of the arms being feathered. These arms might have been covered in quill or filament-like protofeathers that have been exhibited in later theropods like carnosaurs, and that the ancestors to all dinosaurs possessed. This would only support the arm waggling theory, as these feathers would further aid in arm flashing. Here is a good chart displaying the possible speculative extent Carnotaurus had feathers. And once again, speaking about feathers, some paleontologists actually suspect the scales of Ablerosaurids might have been once feathers themselves, condensed and hardened like avian scales in modern birds, or the fur of the pangolin. But even with all this talk of feathers, this does not change that the majority body of Carnotaurus was indeed scaly, nothing can change that. So Carnotaurus was most likely, if not entirely scaly, and might have feathers on the arms, which just didn't preserve in the only specimen we have. But with limited specimens, it's unclear. So, Carnotaurus, scaly, extremely fast, long-legged pursuit predator with horns that could be used for a wide range of things, for display, marking trees, or even head-shoving contests. It also had tiny, vestigial arms that could have been used for an even more wide range of uses, from locking partners during mating, and even elaborate dances where they could have been covered in arm feathers and used in tandem with the horns, from a frontal-facing angle, to impress females or to intimidate rivals. I think Carnotaurus has now become my favorite dinosaur, like, ever. Now it's time to finish off this surprisingly in-depth episode by examining Carnotaurus's pop culture depictions. The most famous and notable entry of Carnotaurus being featured in pop culture is Disney's Dinosaur, where a pair of massive Carnotauruses are seen slowly hunting a large herd of dinosaurs throughout the span of the movie. And although this is probably the most notable entry, and I will not lie, the Carnotauruses look very awesome and very threatening. I, and I totally remember having a super awesome toy version of these guys when I was a kid, it is far from accurate. First of all, Disney's Carnotaurus was way too big. This film shows it at least being as big if not bigger than T-Rex. Disney's Carnotaurus is shown towering above the Iguanodon, and, and according to the behind the scenes features in the DVD, Carnotaurus is at least 15 feet tall in the movie. In reality, Carnotaurus was much much smaller, being only 10 to 12 feet tall, and was actually much smaller than Iguanodon. In the movie, Carnotaurus also has a very, very fat and bulky look. In reality, Carnotaurus was very lightly built and would have looked rather skinny. The legs especially of Carnotaurus are inaccurate. They aren't really long nor skinny enough. The legs on these Carnotauruses are way too fat and pillar-like, unlike the thin built legs of the real Carno. And lastly, the hands are very inaccurate. The hands are way too long and too big, not to mention they are pronated in the complete opposite way. The hands should be pointed backwards with the palms facing inward towards the body. Nonetheless, I love this depiction of Carnotaurus and is very awesome looking and absolutely love the devil-like coloration that really puts emphasis on the horns and devil-like appearance of Carnotaurus. Carnotaurus has also had some representation in the Jurassic Park series, but only in the books as a Carnotaurus was also featured in the Lost World novel in 1995, where a pack of Carnotauruses would run in with the ability to change color like an octopus to blend into its surroundings. This concept was later reused for the Indominus Rex in Jurassic World. Carnotaurus definitely did not change color like an octopus. That is all. Also, Carnotaurus was not featured in Jurassic Park 3. I've heard a lot of people say this, and this is untrue. The dinosaur seen in the movie was actually a relative of Carnotaurus, Ceratosaurus, not Carnotaurus. The Carnotaurus in Ark Survival Evolved is weird, as the dossier is very inaccurate. Just look at those arms, very long and facing forward. 
And don't give me that subspecies crap, all abarasaurids had tiny backward facing arms. A further thing that is inaccurate is the overlapping scales. Paleontologists specify describing the scales of Carnotaurus didn't overlap. And again, don't give me that subspecies excuse, all abarasaurids had these similar scales. The actual in-game model of Carnotaurus has been fixed and has been given some corrections to the inaccuracies in the dossier, as the one in the game does have accurate tiny backward facing arms. The overlapping snake-like scales have been fixed to mosaic scales, yet this Carnotaurus still lacks osteoderms, an important feature to Carnotaurus and very unique to the group. Another possible issue is Carnotaurus is still massive, towering over a human, three times taller than it. When in real life, Carnotaurus was just about three feet taller than a person. I guess this could be due to the Carnotaurus seen in the game being a subspecies that is slightly taller. Besides that, the actual in-game model for Carnotaurus is still pretty accurate, and that is a rare thing for me to say about most animals in ARK. Another appearance was in the short-running TV series Terra Nova, where a group of Carnotauruses hunt and try to kill humans. The Carnotauruses look alright for the most part, but they have a few problems. The biggest and just downright most shameful one is, once again, like the Dossier or an Ark, they have completely donked up the arms. They have been given long Jurassic Park Velociraptor arms, and that, are, that is very inaccurate. The arms are totally incorrectly pronated. They should be facing backward with the palms facing in inward. Also, I can't really tell, but I think the Carnotaurus might have three fingers, when in reality they had four. The one saving grace of this depiction is that they added speculative arm feathers along with the accurate scales, and I definitely respect that. As said before, it is possible Abyrosaurids had arm feathers existing alongside the scales, so that's good. And that's about it as far as pop culture depictions of Carnotaurus go, and what a disappointment, such a unique and interesting dinosaur with a ton of strange traits, and nobody's actually represented it correctly or represented it enough. None of these depictions elaborate or, di or display Carnotaurus's speed, horns, and arms, and I'm just surprised that a really, really awesome piece of source material hasn't gotten much credit as it should, which is actually kind of sad. As said before, I've learned so much about this amazing dinosaur, and it's actually my favorite dinosaur, hands down. I wish it got more representation, so people of the world, let's feature more Carnotaurus in pop culture. Carnotaurus the Cretaceous Cheeto, with tiny arms and horns. As far as we know, it is unlike anything else in this planet's history. Thanks for watching. And that's all the time we have for this video, and boy this was a very in-depth analysis of Carnotaurus. Hope you learned something new. I know I definitely have. Again, thank you so much for watching, and thank you so much for all those who have supported me on my journey to 100,000 subscribers. Expect a 100,000 subscriber special coming soon, so stay tuned. Sorry that this video took so long, I've been so busy. So uh, bye. And no, happy Thanksgiving. Stay safe.